Here is my Christmas gift to you. This is it, you guys, the final video of 2020. Insert 2020 has flown by a joke somewhere around here. <laughs> and as a slightly late Christmas present slash slightly early New Year's present, I decided to give you a this, a the very final style study of 2020. I know this holiday season isn't the most festive or the most social one ever, but no matter where you are, I do hope you're being safe and feeling the cheer regardless. I know I'm sending you all of the love and light in the world, and I do hope you have an amazing holiday season wherever you are in the world, whatever your situation may be. Alright, so today's video was requested three separate times and I am so glad it was because this is by far the most fun I've had working on a cell study ever. So a massive thank you to Jed or J-E-D, um, Robin Andrew Tuzon and Edo Art for requesting this video. As you've read in the title, today we're going to close off 2020 with a brand new style study on one of my new favourite artists of all time, Gouwes. Now, if you're familiar with style studies, you can skip to part one. Timestamps are in the description as well as in the seek bar below. But if you're new here, I generally do my style studies in three parts. In part one, we'll look at Gouwes' work and analyze his style, see what we can learn from it. Part two will be a study of one of his original paintings. The reference I chose today was this one. And in part three, we'll apply everything that we learned today to a brand new original painting of our own. As always, if you enjoyed this video, then please remember to like, comment, subscribe. That would be an amazing Christmas present for me. Um, but now let's jump into another style study featuring Gouwes. So a couple of things I would like to clarify first. One, I am not trying to imitate anyone's art in this series. What we do here is try to learn from some amazing artists so we can be better at our own painting. Plus, I mostly made this series as a form of appreciation for my favourite artists and it kind of blew up with people wanting to see studies of their own favourite artists. And secondly, you'll find that in parts two and three, I don't copy the exact painting methods of the original artists. I'm working on a whole other series for that called Technique Tryout, but here with style studies, we only look at the end product and try to achieve that with our own methods. Those are just some common queries I get in the comment section, so I thought I would clear up the confusion. All right, let's dive in. Gu Zheng Wei, better known by his online name Gu Wei's, is a freelance digital artist from Singapore. I was a little confused about how to say Gu Wei's, but luckily for us, he had an awesome book deal with 3D Total Publishing, and in the accompanying video for the Kickstarter, you actually hear his voice, and yep, mystery solved, it's Gu Wei's. His art mainly consists of fantasy character art that often incorporates real-life settings, creating a beautiful mix of ambient portraits that convey more emotion and story than simply just technical skill. Looking back at his early work, Gouwei started off with heavy influence from popular manga-based semi-realism art. Over time, however, you see his style evolve from pure high fantasy character art to the more scenic, story-centric illustrations. There are many incredibly unique aspects to his art that make it instantly recognizable, and those are the ones that we're gonna look at today. So now, put out your milk and cookies and get some carrots for the reindeer, cause it's time to get on the nice list. Get it? Cause Christmas? Oh, okay. <laughs> Here are the five key characteristics to Gouwes' art. If you look at any of Gouwes' characteristic paintings, you'll instantly notice that the first thing that jumps out at you is the storyline. 
Honestly, his art isn't so much illustrations as it is almost these snapshots of the characters' lives. Like, when you look at Agüe's painting, you can very easily imagine the scenes that may have occurred before and after the scene that is in the actual painting. His work evokes a ton of ambience, not just through the many compositional elements such as rain and snow, or the lighting, but also the colour palette itself. On the 3D total page, it says that his work is often inspired by life in Japan, and you can definitely see that in the costumes and background. However, his work takes everyday situations and turns it dark and dramatic, and indeed very poetic. In fact, here's a line from the book description that honestly puts it better than I ever could, because it describes his work as having gritty details of the urban landscape and dark, surreal tones. And that is honestly the exact word that I would use to describe his art, is gritty. Not just in the sense of gravel and stone, but also in the sense of power and nerve. I know these are very abstract descriptions because how do you paint nerve? But <laughs> it's all in the storytelling elements. The characters form a strong, well-defined silhouette against a softer, more abstract background. There is a lot of framing in the composition, which, sure, it acts as leading lines, but these framing elements also create a sense of stability and sturdiness. In fact, a large part of the grit, so to speak, comes from the character's pose itself. We'll look at this in detail in just a second, but this overarching theme in Gueza's work is that of power and drama without relying on the usual elements of bright lights or crazy perspective. Alright, I'll bet this one jumped out at you as much as it jumped out at me. The biggest element of drama in Gueza's work comes from how he plays with the values in each piece. Like we saw just now, the characters form a strong dominating presence over the more abstract background. This is because Gueza really pushes the sense of atmospheric perspective. If you've watched a bunch of style studies or just tutorials on composition, you'll know that atmospheric perspective is when you split your composition into foreground, midground, and background elements. And the further into the background something is, the lighter it appears because it is clouded by the atmosphere in between. Conversely, the closer to you something is, the darker it appears because there isn't as much heavy atmosphere in the way. You'll see this in Gueza's work, where the character, often in the foreground, forms a dark silhouette against a usually way paler background. In fact, you won't find any super dark tones beyond the midground at all. Everything behind the foreground character is generally several tones lighter, with much lower contrast. That's not to say, however, that the background is super white, either. In fact, if you were to color pick the lightest background tone, you'd probably find that it's a mid to light grey. However, it is several shades lighter than the silhouette itself. Oh, but Swish, what about this one where the background has darker elements? No, my friend, those branches are in the midground. While they are still behind the character, they aren't all the way in the distance. Here, the only background you see is in between the branches in these paler bits. Similarly, here, you'll see that although the giant cat is behind her, it has some darker tones. But again, just like with those branches, the cat is actually in the midground, not the background. The buildings behind the cat are actually what lie in the background, and as you can tell, those are very light and low contrast. That's not to say, however, that all of the foreground elements are straight up black. Clearly, you can see that there are some very bright tones, especially in the skin and clothing. The point is, the foreground elements have the highest contrast versus the background where there isn't as much separation between the lightest and darkest tones. So here's a picture of my notes for this video and honestly, this sums up the color choices really nicely. The colour palette in Gueza's art is obviously very grey. Or is it? 
Because if you look closer, you'll find that it only appears grey. And this, my friends, is a trick of the eye. The painting appears grey when, in fact, it is generally a very low saturated pale blue or green. But because it is made up of only darker or lighter tones of the same low saturation blue or green, and there isn't too much colour variation, everything seems super grey. In fact, I find that even the darkest tones that appear to be black are actually just a super dark, super low saturation blue or green. As you can tell, Gouet generally uses a very limited colour palette and I found that he often sticks to complementary tones. So if the painting is mostly composed of low saturation blue, the foreground will have accents of orange. If the painting is mostly low saturation greens, the foreground will have accents of red. However, even the colour accents are fairly low saturation and value, as in even the most colourful bits are very grey and dark. The only time you'll ever see a bright, high saturated colour is in these small glowy elements. So you'll see a glowing earring or some flying embers and little specks of glowing light. And these are pretty much always a bright orange or yellow. You'll almost never find an overall warm red-orange piece that has a bright blue accent. Why? Because again, Gouet always prioritizes a gloomy mood and dark ambience over bright, vivid colour stories. The biggest thing you need to know about the characters themselves is that these are not aesthetically driven character portraits. Don't get me wrong, they are absolutely gorgeous, but aesthetic prettiness is not the core motivation when it comes to Gouraise's characters. Sure, they are conventionally attractive and have slim slender bodies, but like we've seen so far, the focus is always on the story. So you'll notice that the characters aren't necessarily posing for the camera. A great contrast to this is the very heavily aesthetic pin-up art of Stalsa de veteran Sakimi Chan. Her characters are specifically painted to look pretty and visually appealing and their poses and proportions reflect this. With Gu Wei's, however, this is not the priority. So you'll find that the characters are posed in a very natural way in that they're usually in action, be it actual fighting or just walking. Even at rest, they look very natural. What I mean by natural is that if you and I were in the same scene, these are generally the poses that we would assume. It's not a put on pose in order to display their costumes or strength or anything like that. It is simply a general everyday action. You've definitely sat around the house looking like this. I know I've been in this exact pose while doing the laundry. Oh god, that brings back war flashbacks. If you've ever used university laundry machines in the UK, you know what wash station is. And if so, I am so sorry for the trauma that you've been through. You have my sympathies. But anyway, coming back to the study, <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is that even the characters, their proportions and their poses serve to push the story of each piece. Usually with character art, we find that the background elements in the scene serve to tell the character's story, but in Gouwez's work, the characters serve to tell the story of the scene around them. Because you'll see that the flowy elements on the characters are in harmony with the flowy elements in the background, and all the important framing elements on and around the character are important story elements, like the wide-rimmed hats, for instance. While they're a very common element that really strengthen the silhouette, each hat tells a different story. Here, the material and relative flatness of the hat, along with the horns that echo the swords on her back, are all reminiscent of samurai warriors. Here, the floppiness of the rim and the silhouette of the top of the hat makes you think of a traditional witch hat. And here, the stiff rim and the narrower but equally stiff top, while paired with the vest and the white button-down shirt, make you think of a cowboy hat. Again, none of these hats are identical to any of the traditional hats, but when you put them with the rest of the character, those are the stories that you get. 
One very strong attribute of the characters, however, is the grit that we spoke of earlier. You see, the characters have the usual flowing elements like the hair and the fabric to add dynamism. However, you'll find that the characters themselves stand stark against this flow. So here, for instance, while her hair and cape are very wind-blown, her body and her arms are unaffected by the sway. Same thing here, where her hair and large floppy sleeves are swept up in the breeze, she stands strong and steady against said breeze. And it is this contrast between the flowing elements and the steady pose that create this sense of grit in the story. It's as if there are these forces that are actively working against her, sweeping away the weaker elements, but she isn't even ruffled by it. Like I said, you guys, the character serves the story. Alright, so we've seen that Gu Wei's really gives us drama and mood through his paintings, so surely the lighting plays a massive role in creating the drama, right? Well, yes, but no. <laughs> Let me explain. Yes, the lighting plays a huge role in creating the drama, but the lighting setup itself isn't dramatic. Because when you look at the entire scene, you'll see that there aren't any super harsh shadows or light. Yes, there are dark and light values, but they aren't very pronounced. Everything, especially on the character, is softly blended. So you won't see strong shadows or Rembrandt lighting on the face, you won't see crazy specular highlights in the skin, nor will you see sharp drop shadows. In fact, the only shadows you'll see are the ambient occlusion. You see, the lighting setup is very diffused and very soft because, again, the story. The atmosphere is gloomy and foggy and misty and rainy and snowy. So as we see in real life, an overcast day creates a very soft, diffused light, as opposed to a bright, strong light that you would see on a sunny day. But if everything is so soft and the colours are so muted, where does the drama even come from? It all goes back to the values. All of the drama, all of it, comes from the dramatic value shifts in the foreground versus the low contrast of the background. How do I know this? Because if you take any Gouet's painting and turn it black and white, it's still as dramatic as the coloured version. And another super subtle detail I noticed, one I almost missed in fact, is this very, very subtle rim light around the character. I'm not talking about this type of portrait where the rim light is part of the story. I'm talking more about paintings like this one. It is so subtle, you probably don't consciously see it unless it's pointed out to you. But what Gu Wei's does is make sure that the outermost edges of the character are relatively dark. And as we've already seen, the background is several shades lighter, but like I said, it isn't crazy pale. And that's because he then adds a very soft outline of a much brighter colour right at the edges of the character. This effectively separates the foreground character from the background and it is in such a subtle way that you wouldn't consciously register it. And the reason that this works so nicely is twofold. One, it essentially pushes the character smack dab in your face while the background gets pushed far, far into the distance. And two, it further heightens the atmosphere. You see, a lot of Gouez's work contains falling rain and snow, and what does rain do? It splashes off the edges of hard surfaces. And if you observe rainy days enough, you'll see that often these little splashes tend to form a bit of an aura around objects and people. You'll often even see this on very foggy or misty days. Light tends to bounce off of the solid objects but refracts heavily throughout the wet mist. And on the surface of waterproof and reflective objects, there is a higher bounce of light, which is also slowed down by the density of the fog. This, in turn, creates a subtle aura around said objects. So by painting in the super subtle aura around the object, Gouet's further pushes the heavy, dense atmosphere, creating a lot more drama in the piece. Honestly, this is the biggest takeaway from this style study for me personally. Whew, 
That was a massive analysis. I'm just gonna say a quick prayer for editing Swish because this one is gonna be a treat to edit. <laughs> but to sum up, here are the five key characteristics to Gouez's art. Number one, everything, everything in the painting comes down to the story. Every element, every value shift, all of it serves to push the story of the piece. Two, Gouez loves to play with atmospheric perspective by keeping the background fairly mid-toned and low contrast, while all of the dramatic light and dark tones are front and center in the foreground. Number three, the color palette is fairly muted and although it appears very gray, the colors are generally varying values of blue or green. You'll often see a warmer accent tone such as orange or red, but these are often dark and unsaturated as well. The only real bright hot colors you'll see are in the tiny scattered glowing elements such as jewelry or embers. Number four, the characters are posed to appear natural and like they belong in their environment. Everything about them serves to further push the story. And number five, even though the scene itself is super dramatic, the lighting setup is actually very soft and diffused, which further pushes the whole grey, rainy day aesthetic. For the study this week, here's the reference that I chose. It's called Inspector, and it's probably the first ever side profile study that I've done on this series. Right from the get-go, this one was a challenge. Remember, the more realistic a face it is, the harder it is to achieve a likeness. For no reason other than our own minds get in the way, because we know what a real face looks like, so it becomes harder to paint what we actually see versus what we expect to see. Plus, I haven't actually painted a hat before, which, how is this possible? I've done hundreds of paintings, how have I never painted a hat? Honestly, that's the real lesson in this video, Swish has never painted a hat before. Anyway, with the sketch done, I went ahead and blocked in the silhouette. Like we saw in part 1, the character forms a dark solid silhouette against the paler, more abstract background. It was a little bit of a challenge to get the colours exactly right because all of the rain is in the way. But I found that while there are a few hue shifts like the redness under the eye versus the more bluey grey around the lower half of the cheek, there aren't many saturated or super bright tones. All of the colours in the skin are very, very similar to each other and you're only really getting a couple of hues up and down. Saturation is super low and with this particular piece, the colours were mostly blue with some very grey orange tones in the skin and the costume. Of course the glowy earring is a very bright element, but it is really small and the glow is very localised. So here is the painting that I ended up with. I personally think mine turned out looking a little more angry than the original one, but well, I had a grumpy start that morning, okay, so yeah. <laughs> Alrighty, for the original painting today, and the very final painting for 2020, you guys, we're gonna add a fourth installment to the Dark Astrology series. So far, we've done Aries the Unheeding, Taurus the Possessive, and Gemini the Inconsistent. Today, we look at the fourth sign of the Zodiac, Cancer. Now, Cancer is a water sign, meaning that it has to do with emotions and intuition. It is also a cardinal sign, which means that it signifies a change in seasons. In this case, Cancer season falls in June to July, so it signifies a change from spring to summer, at least in the Western world. Here in India, it's just all a mess. Okay. <laughs> 
Kemsa is signified by the crab, and I actually found a cool lore story thing behind the constellation. Ancient Greek civilizations believed that the constellation of Cancer was created when Heracles, or Hercules, who was fighting Hydra, was bitten on the heel by a giant crab called Carcinos. Enraged, he crushed the crab with his heel, and by favour of Heracles' mother, Hera, the remains of the crab were put among the stars, forming the constellation of Cancer. How cool is that? <laughs> when Cancer goes dark side, however, it tends to be overly emotional, clingy and pessimistic, as well as defensive like the hard shell of a crab. Here I've tried to put all of that together into this painting, which is set in the sky. I've spread the crab legs far and wide to show the scattered remains of Carquinos. I've shown her holding dying pansies, which are spring flowers. The wilting flowers have made her so sad and pessimistic that she doesn't notice that freshly blooming impatience behind her, which are flowers that grow in the summer that follows spring. I also showed her to have several thick layers of clothes and a veil, and the silhouette of the top of her head was inspired by the hermit crab. In keeping with the theme of the study, you'll see me paint a subtle lighter aura around her, as well as a paler background versus her darker clothes and silhouette. Plus, the summer flowers behind her add that pop of orange glow. This one took a lot of back and forth with the colours because while I was trying to keep it as unsaturated as possible, I also needed it to match the other three pieces of the series. But hey, apparently we love a good challenge in this video today, so there's that. <laughs> so here's the finished painting from the video. You can check it out over on my Patreon, I have it up as downloads, printables and wallpapers. I will also be redoing the rewards for Patreon in the new year and I have a poll on my community post tab and will be so so grateful if you could take a second to help me figure out what content you want to see on there in 2021. So check out the poll in my community post tab, I would be super appreciative. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video and found it helpful. Leave me a comment below letting me know which artists you would like to see on this series. Massive thank you once again to Jed, Robin, Andrew, Tuzon and Ido Art for requesting this video. I hope you guys enjoy it and love it and learn from it as much as I have. If you have enjoyed this video then please remember to give me a big thumbs up, comment below, hit that subscribe button and a quick announcement, I will be taking New Year's week off which means there will be no video next week because let's face it, your girl is stressed. So it's only a week though and I hope this super long video makes up for it. <laughs> But yeah, I hope you guys have a wonderful New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. I can't wait to get into 2021 and leave this year behind. <laughs> but with all of that said, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And I'll see you guys in the next year. Bye. <laughs>